This quick story is, um, I told this to Murray and Rosie last night, that um, it was the first week of January, maybe the second week, and, and it was the end of our second service in Phoenix at our church and called Living Streams. And uh, I was at the sound, sound booth back at the end, and some, a friend came up to me. She said, so how's it going? And I go, I'll give it another six months. <laughs> She said, well, what does that mean? And I said, I have no idea. And the word just came out of my mouth. Next week, I got a call from Shmuley Oppenheim, January 16, 1996. And he said, Highland, would you pray and consider moving up to Seattle to take over, become the rabbi of a messianic, four-square messianic congregation? Hallelujah. And uh, I said, well, I, I guess we could pray, you know. Last thing on my mind, but God was really working in us already. And a lot of details in there. You can ask me later if you're interested. Or you can ask me. No. <laughs> or you can ask John. Yeah. Um, anyway, so that was on January 16th I got the call. We actually drove out of Phoenix on July 15th. Six months less a day. Wow. And that's just one little piece of what God was doing. So, um, it was not easy filling your shoes, Murray Silverlane. Uh, <laughs> what size do you wear anyway? Because <laughs> we, we wear our own shoes. And I'm, I'm just blessed to to be able to introduce you today, and uh, like you don't even need an introduction, we've all re been hearing your name all day. So, what, what do they say in the movies without further ado? I don't even know what that means. <laughs> what, is, what is ado? <laughs> right. Must be French. Let's welcome the Murray Silver. You're so funny. <laughs> we say it to each other. <laughs> that was funny. <laughs> well, Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Something <laughs> else about this. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> A brother from another brother. Ah, <laughs> uh, you know, such nachis to be here and to see all of you. I just feel so good. Mm. And I listen to all the wonderful things you say and I'm going, who is that guy they're talking about? <laughs> uh, but, you know, I, I felt it over all that you have become. You know, when you have a child, you look at that little child and you go, I wonder what they're gonna be when they grow up. And now here it is, what, 40 years? Yeah. And you see what God has done. And I'll tell you, this, the Spirit of God is in this place. Amen. And He's working in your lives, doing such amazing things. I might have been an absent father, you know, 30 years gone from you. But I can tell that God has been doing so much and working within your lives and within this congregation. And I really want to thank uh, Rabbi Hyland and Rita for coming, for obeying, and, and being here and doing this. And you have done such a great work. Let's give them a hand. Seeing some of my old friends that I dance with and dancing with you and listening to you worship while you dance uh, just reminds me of so many wonderful old times that we have had together. Well, yeah, we started a long time ago. 40 is an interesting number in, in this. And I first started in 1982. I started Emmaus. Christian Center. That shows how little that I knew, because I didn't even know there was such a thing as a Messianic synagogue or a Messianic congregation. And so I just was, was taking what God was doing in my life and calling me to something, and I'll explain a little bit about that, and the uh, prophetic emphasis of that, which some have alluded to. But I started that at uh, uh, Taijun High School with 13 people. 
Mm. Wow. Well, 13 of us. Mm -hmm. That's a big place to have just 13 people in this huge, you know, cafeteria setting. But, but uh, God was doing something. Hallelujah. And more than anything, he was doing something in me. Amen. Because he was saying, I, I knew that I had to establish a messianic work. I didn't even know what to call it or what it was about. But, but as I began to move in that direction, I, I had to learn so much. And you know, it's not easy to learn. There's so many new things. Even though I was raised in a Jewish family and went through, you know, bar mitzvah and everything, all of that, now I had to learn about the meaning of all these things as a believer in Yeshua, the Messiah of Israel. And, you know, putting it all together was, was something that was really challenging. So I worked on that. We started off with a, you know, a few holidays. I think the first year we just did like Hanukkah and, uh, and a high hot Rosh Hashanah or Yom Kippur. And, you know, because I didn't know how to do any of these things. It wasn't until like 1985 that uh, the, the young Jewish girl who led me to the Lord called me and said, you know, there's a whole group of Messianic rabbis that meet the Messianic Jews Alliance of America and you know you ought to get in touch with them and I gave them a call in 85 and Shmuel was also a part of this he called me and said yeah come on we'll come out with a few leaders we'll talk with you we'll help you with uh, the establishment of this congregation so yeah it was an auspicious beginning wow. we went from uh, there from Tai E, we went to the Ashwood Center, and that was like just a room this size, and that's all we had. And we had to make that work. And the, the interesting thing was, then we got a notice, yes, to turn down the Ashwood Center in about a week. You've got, you know, like a, a week to get out. And I'm sitting there going, what do you mean, a week to get out? Where are we gonna go? There's, and so we began to pray and seek what God wanted to do. Then we ended up at uh, Hayek Middle School wow. and in the library there. And uh, by then we were getting up to 150 people or so. Wow. And, and uh, a, a lot of Jewish people were coming out. There was a nice size a group of Jewish people that were being interested in this. And from there we went to, we. We decided we were going to build, do a build out with the lease, and we did that. That was the plaza. But, but they, they were t kicking us out of Hayat uh, because they were like closing it down. You know, that was in the days when they were closing schools. And they were closing it down. And so we had to get out two weeks before our facility was ready. So we said, okay, we'll start meeting at the Bellevue Convention Center. Mary Ann remembers all of these days. She <laughs> suffered through all of that turmoil. But you know what it was like when we think about 40 years, what about the 40 years in the desert for the children of Israel wandering, 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 not knowing where they were going? You know? What about Abraham being called, let's look high, go forth into a land that you don't even know anything about? That's, that's where I was. I was going into a land, into a ministry, into, you know, buildings, everything that I knew nothing about. And yet I was following that call because that's the most important thing is getting called, hearing the call, obeying the call, following the call. And that's exactly what we did. And then from there, it was so wonderful. By then, you know, there were some other Messianic congregations starting in the late uh, 80s, and we, we started what was the Northwest In Gathering. And we would bring, uh, like from uh, Vancouver, uh, up in Canada, and from other places around here, and south, all the way down to Portland, we would bring Messianic congregations and Messianic fellowships and Messianic individuals and bring, have an in-gathering, a big celebration. And we had uh, uh, Warren Beach and other places, and then finally the one in Black, Black Lake. And I'll tell you, 
uh, uh, Carol Cantrell doing ministry there, and and we we would spend the whole night like just on our knees and on our faces and worshiping and praying, and it was just the most amazing outpouring that I have ever experienced in all of my years of ministry. But God was moving and God was calling, God was doing. And there, the Tacoma area was interesting because I, I got asked to go down there because there was a whole group of Jew, Russian Jews who were wanted to have a Bible study. So I started going down once every couple of weeks. You know what that's like. Then once a week, yeah. And then finally after two years, they basically developed themselves into a congregation and they asked me to start an actual synagogue there. And we did, and that was Beit Simcha. And uh, that was the first place, that was in 87 we started that. And that was the first place where we did start doing a lot of dancing uh, and bringing things back from all over, and Israeli dance, etc. The worship was wonderful. <clears throat> and I just want to say, Bob Davison, I love your worship. Yeah. It's been a long time since I've been able to just sit and be a part of it and just uh, let you lead me up to the throne. And you are so good and you have such a heart and ability to just say, this is the way. Keep going. Lift those hands. Lift those voices. Do it. He, God is really blessed. So many people here that God has blessed over the years, and I am so glad to be a part of it. Well, and of course, then MDI started, and all the dance ministry, and finally, in, I think it was 1991, I wrote this little book called Dancing for Joy. <laughs> and uh, it's amazing, because I still have people that come over to the congregation to uh, the Monah, and they'll come in and they'll they, they say, oh yeah, we want to see the dancing, we want to dance, because we read the book. <laughs> you know, and I'm just like, are you kidding me, that book's still out there? Yeah, yeah, you can go on Amazon. <laughs> and, uh, but, but you know, dance is obviously, has been such a part of my life, and still is, my wife Rosie and I, we go dancing twice a week in the Israeli community. I've been to so many dance camps around the world, and I just love doing it, and thank God I can still do it. Uh, and, but you know, all of you, you are a part of my life in, do, in doing that, learning how to worship and dance, and how to really give your heart, soul, and your body to worship in God. So I would encourage any of you if you want to get involved in those things. Well, so here we are, 40 years late. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. How did we make it this far? And yet, how did we how did we make it this far and still have the blessing of God in our lives? It's his graciousness. 40 years when you think about it. And it's interesting because um, I think most of us want to find ourselves being made over, like get a makeover, to be renewed. And of course, we always want it instantly, right? <laughs> we want an instant makeover. Well, that's what this 40-day time of from, Rosh, from uh, uh, Rosh Chodesh and Lul, which is today, the first day, all the way to Yom Kippur. These 40 days are to be just exactly that in our lives. In Exodus, in Exodus Rabbah, the rabbis talk about how on the first day of Elul, Moses ascends Mount Sinai, and 40 days later, on Yom Kippur, he returned to the people with a new second set of tablets in his hand, a renewed covenant and word given to us. And it says that after the sin of the golden calf until the giving of the second tablets as a, is a sign of forgiveness that God forgave Israel for their sin of that golden calf. Well, in 40 years, how many of us know we need a lot of that forgiveness? 
40 years, we've done so many different things and we've wandered in so many different ways. Amen. But that's what it's about. It's renewal. It's a renewal not just of body, it's a renewal of our soul, a renewal of our spirit, a renewal of God's call in our lives. The number 40, symbolic of purification and also of renewal. Remember Noah's flood? Right? The earth was purified from wickedness and for 40 days. And then they ended up all those who were evil and those others got to stay. Remember Jonah's call, the Ninevites. He went there and he says, 40 days, repent. And if you don't, big trouble, right? The earth was purified and not uh, during Noah, and here was a call to repentance from wickedness, and God wanted to make a whole new empire, and he took some of the worst people, the Ninevites, the most evil, corrupt, cruel, and brutal people, and he changed their hearts. Amen. That's, those are the testimonies I'm hearing here today, what God did. The 40 years in the desert, as I say, going from the people going from a slave mentality to becoming an actual new people who are now ready to enter into the land. Yeah. Now here, the interesting part is, <coughs> the Talmud says that the Torah was given in 40 days, but the soul was formed also in 40 days. Mm -hmm. Just think, the next 40 days by Yom Kippur, how much of your soul can be reformed? Glory. How much of that, that second covenant can come in and renew you? How much you can be purified by God? Yeah. 40 years, it says, it made a whole new generation. Mm -hmm. Now, Yeshua went in, was led into the desert, Luke chapter 4, and for 40 days he was tempted. Yeah. Wow. Then came he at the beginning, he wasn't ready, but then came the beginning of his public ministry. Satan tempted Yeshua for those days during this time with pride and power and unbelief. Te tempted him, tested him. This was a fearful time for Yeshua, but it didn't touch him in one way or other because God was working in his life, calling him. He had called him to a job to do. And Yeshua knew what that job was. Well, you and me. You know, I always ask myself, why would anyone be a part of a Messianic congregation? Right? You stick and stay in the church and you are just comfortable as can be. And services, 40 minutes, that's it. And you're out and you, and you can sleep through most of them. Right? And that's all you have to learn is the sinner's prayer and you know, you know, God loves you, died, died for you, blah, blah, blah. And that's it. I mean, there's not a lot of learning, not a lot of anything. But then you can also go into the synagogue. That's sort of comfortable too. But there'll always be people, you know, nipping at you. Why don't you do that? And why don't you play? And why do you have that? And so it gets a little annoying. <laughs> but it's definitely a pretty comfortable place because you were raised as a Jew, so uh, comfortable. Then you end up choosing to become a border community <laughs> that belongs nowhere. <laughs> That's not Christian and not rabbinic, but somehow is a Jewish and belief in Yeshua and power of the Holy Spirit in your life and you are like a new creation. Something so different that has never been around before like that. You see, God has established in the Messianic Synagogue something so new and so unique. How do you know if you're supposed to be there? You hear the call. You hear the call, right? Like Abraham, like all, you hear the call. And when that call comes, and that's what you, you have been saying, you know, today, those of you who have shared, 
You know, somehow you came here, you were home. Why were you home? Because you heard your father talking to you. Saying, you know, this, this one who died for you, he's the one who's going to take you the rest of the way. He's the one who's going to bless you. He's going to give you the blessings and not the curses. He's the one who's going to do this. Are you ready? And you say, yes, Lord, I'm coming. And then you end up in this community. Now, I, I want to just say a few words about what a Messianic synagogue is. And you'll, you've heard it, it was said by many of the people here. But maybe you didn't catch it because it was a part of their story or testimony or whatever. And I want to clarify all of it for you. Remember in Genesis, God says, Abraham says, can make a covenant with you and through you, all, all the Gentiles will either be blessed or all of the Gentiles will be cursed. How people relate to you as Israel. That's both a responsibility and it is also a privilege to be a part of that remnant, that creation. And he told me, and then another verse that came out in one of the people's talks where they said, to the Jew first. Well, that's good when it's blessings. <laughs> but when it's curses or testing or, you know, uh, closing their eyes for a while so, till God finishes doing his work or making sure that they're holy to represent him correctly, uh, some of those things are not as easy to the Jew first. And so here we are as a Messianic congregation, we have, we have to somehow try to reach out there to this, to this community of Jews and for Gentiles who want to know. Now when I first came uh, here in the Northwest, it was so amazing. Most of the pastors that I would talk to didn't even know that Passover had anything to do with Jewish people. <laughs> they thought it all came out of, you know, like Corinthians 11. And it was one of Paul's, you know, things that he created for, about Jesus. And, and so, the, no history to it, no context to it. But they've changed so much yeah. over these 40 years, yeah. haven't they? Because everyone really wants to know who this Yeshua is, and they want to learn about him. And that's so important for us. To the Jew first. How is the Jew going to know? Romans 10, 14. How are they going to know? Who's going to tell them? Could we hire somebody? Oh, we'll get a marketing firm. I'll go on the radio, right? And do a program. I'll call it the Road to Emmaus, right? No, how are they going to know? They're going to know because you, as a person, reach out to them. You love them, you give them his love, and you tell them in a Jewish context, in the Tanakh, as well as the Brit Chadashah, you tell them who this Yeshua is. You take them to the Gospel, and you take them to Israel as you take them to that Gospel, where he lived, where he died for them, where he was buried, where he rose, all of it right there in that Jewish context. I remember Ben Gigi, you know, talking about the Ben Gigi, he, he would always say, yeah, they kept telling me to read the Bible, the, the, the New Testament. I'm going, I don't want to read those Goetia things. And so he says, then I finally opened it up. I started to read and I go, wait, that's taking place right here in Israel. These are the cities I go to. This is all very Jewish. Everything he's practicing and doing is Jewish. What's going on here? And that opened them up completely because the context was for an Israeli it, to be a Messiah, have a Messiah there in Israel. So a Messianic congregation has to be a place to learn. It's got to be a place to learn how to live the Torah in a community because Torah is really hard to do outside of a community. Because, you know, when you're doing, you know, like a Shabbat thing and it's just you by yourself, it just loses something, right? You know, you light the candles, you say the blessings, you do all, but you, you need it as a community. When you get together for Shabbat, when you worship together, when you begin to realize that, uh, uh, that 
the things, the, the holidays and other things that you do, you do as a community. And it makes it so powerful. I like uh, Bob was saying when he was here for Purim, you see the kids all dressed up. That's a community passed down from generation to generation. How things have changed. God is asking us to be a community. Amen. Well, I spent, you know, all 40 years now trying to figure out how to be a community. I don't have many answers. And eight, uh, eight years ago, I retired as a congregational leader. Wow, transitions, huh? What's next? And I'll tell you, you know, I, I, I am no longer the congregational leader, but I am Rabbi Emeritus there, which means that they suck me in every once in a while to do things. And, uh, but, you know, I'm still doing weddings, funerals, and all these things like that, and I'm still out there, and I'm witnessing as, as much as I can to people, and I'm very involved in the Israeli dance community and witnessing to Israelis, and, and just, you know, being me, which is, you know, that's all I've ever wanted to be. And I didn't know what that was. But once you retire, you can begin to discover what that is, and again, it's like, it's like this new uh, creation. God makes us new all the time. He, he called me into it. He called me out of that. He called me to something else. And he continues to make us what he wants. There's a makeover going. And I'm telling you. Uh, he called us to be a people. Now, one of the best things, as we've heard, that, that's been happening here uh, over these years is that you have somebody as wonderful as Rabbi Highland and Rita who take all these trips to Israel, give monies and support so many of the congregations and individuals in Israel Amen. and continues to do this. And I'll tell you, it's amazing when you see what's happening over there. They are becoming, they've grown up yeah. because it's not the adults like in my generation, a bunch of uh, Messianic rabbis said, I'm making Aliyah. And then, of course, they went there and tried to transpose their Messianic Judaism to Israel. And it doesn't work. You can't do that. But, but they had children. Thank God that's part of, you know, the, the 40 years you keep having kids. They had children, and their children have grown up there. In, an, in the IDF, in the service. And, and they've gotten jobs and, and involved with all kinds of... Uh, uh, echelons of people within government, etc., lawyers, everything, and they are making such a powerful difference there yeah. because they're just being themselves. But, you know, if it wasn't for the Halutzim, the pioneers who went there and struggled, because I remember in those days, uh, you know, back in the late 70s, early 80s, when they, they were going over there and they were finding themselves feeling very out of it not being able to uh, acculturate to, to things because taking somebody from, you know, L.A. and moving them to, uh, you know, uh, Jerusalem or somewhere, that's a hard change. But they knew that God had called them. Again, that calling, that calling that we get. God building the spiritual house, he's building something there in Israel, and you, you guys get a lot of the thanks for doing that and making that a part of it. And then fighting against anti-Semitism. I think every Messianic synagogue knows that they're dealing with that on a constant basis. How many people have I talked to uh, that are Gentiles who come and say, well, I, I started coming, but um, all of my Christian friends tell me, you know, you can't do that, and that's wrong, and this, and that, or Jewish, you know, uh, people that come and find a lot of the, uh, you know, things that they get from their relatives saying, you're Jewish, you can't do that. Everyone telling you you can't do that, that call better be heard loudly. And it better have penetrated deep enough, or, or you won't last very long, will you? That is a powerful call that is made into our lives. A place where we can come and we can learn. And the first thing I tell people when they come is, 
you're going to have to do a lot of learning. You got to go through the video schedule and all the holidays. You don't have to do them the way I tell you to do them or anyone else tells you to do it, but you have to begin to learn what the scriptures say, and then you've got to pray, and then you've got to apply it into your life, and then you've got to celebrate it. Amen. Yeah. You know? Everyone has to do individually what I did over that 10 years, that first 10 years with the mayors, trying to figure out how to make this a reality and make this real for me and for others too. A place where we can come and learn. Now, when you talk about the changes that have been made, not only with Israel, not only with anti-Semitism, because we're finding a resurgence of that all over, and we need to be able to stand strong against that. And you have someone as wonderful as Rita, who has the background and the experience because of uh, uh, her parents to be able to fight against that, to speak against that, yeah. to reflect, make people understand. Yeah. But also, when you, when, as believers in Yeshua, we have the problem with the New Testament. Now, I get a chance to talk to a lot of Jewish people, Israelis, and rabbis, uh, rabbinic rabbis, and they usually say, well, huh, we're intelligent, and we've studied, and we've read the New Testament, and we know that this, the Gospels that talk about Yeshua, that these Gospels are saying how Jewish he is, and he's a Jew, always was, always will be a Jew. And we go, yes, that's right, you, you got some. But they always then go into, but it was that Paul guy. Yeah. <laughs> he took this great Jewish thing and made it into some kind of a, a Goisha, you know, I think very traif, not kosher. Why did he do that? And you're going, wait a minute, explain. How did he do that? And of course, they haven't read through much of that. But one of the greatest things that's happened over the last, say, 15 years is there's been a lot of academic work done on, the, on Paul and the Jewishness of Paul. A lot of books being written by people both in the Jewish uh, academic community as well as the Christian academic community and they're making it very clear that this Paul was Jewish he never tried to stop people from being Jewish Jews from living that Jewish life and that he was willing to call Gentiles into a new community expression that wasn't like the Catholic Church that they came from but was actually a Jewish community expressing as that new creation a community that was learn, willing to become reacculturated to a Jewish world. So what do we see? Jewish music in Hebrew. Hebrew being taught. Scripture being read in Hebrew from a bima, held up, you know, and when people walk into a, a Masonic synagogue, one of the first things they say is, you guys have so much sense of awe and honor for worship. When I come in there, I, I hear that, that worship, and it's not just Bob's loud, loud booming voice, you know, but that does help. <laughs> but it's, it's that sense that they have that the people there really honor the word. Yeah. And Yeshua the Messiah, the Word made flesh, and they honor the songs and worship. And it doesn't matter if they're like really stoic, like they're in a, a rabbinic synagogue or something like that, or whether they're, you know, jumping up and down, right, and during the, the shout. It doesn't matter. They see the, the passion that you have, and the whole, they sense the Holy Spirit in worship. They sense that same thing when they see dance. How many people come and go, it was the dancing that did it. You know, we saw you dancing and worshiping. I gotta learn how to dance. Yeah. And we go, do you know what a Yemenite is? No, do you know what a Chickasee is? No, why don't you sit over there for a while and just watch? <laughs> Before you knock somebody over. <laughs> but I'll tell you, uh, uh, last week, I had the 30th anniversary at Bethlehem Munah. 
And we had uh, some of the people who have moved away over the last 30 years coming back and we started dancing and oh my, oh my. It was amazing. We were having so much fun, so much joy, and so much praise, and so much worship. And it was, you know, that's what draws people. And how are they going to hear the call? Unless they, if they walk in and they see people really worshiping, that they sense the Holy Spirit's presence, and they hear the word about Yeshua the Messiah, that's, that's going to get them to hear something. Otherwise, it's just, it would be coming and going. In fact, in the scriptures, Paul says that it's the job of the Gentiles to make the Jews jealous. Amen. Believe it or not, <laughs> you know, mo most, most Gentiles want to be Jews. But the Jews, they want to be able to worship like that, like the Gentiles, and be a, you know, live that kind of praise and worship and sense the power of the Spirit of God in their lives. It's a place to observe and to celebrate the Jewish holidays. How many of you like holidays? Oh, yeah. I mean, we have everything from something a little more somber, like Yom Kippur, all the way to like Purim, where everyone is, you know, very clownish in what we do, and nothing is what it seems. Everything is hafuk, it's upside down. You know, I mean, that's who we are. We take Leviticus and we, we, we live it seriously in our lives, apply it in these holidays. God gave these mordim. He gave them to us. Yeah. Appointments for us to be able to worship Him. And, and we're going to do them. We're going to do them together. And sometimes, you know, if you move to somewhere like in the middle of, you know, to Pagosa Springs, Colorado or something, it's really hard to find a Messianic synagogue. And it's also very hard when it comes time for the high holidays or whatever. But Rosie and I, we, we've celebrated the high holidays in Malaga, Spain. It was amazing. We went to a Sephardic synagogue, and to an Ashkenazi synagogue, and we were just enjoying so much. And, you know, you, it doesn't matter where it is. We are all part of, you know, the body of Messiah. We can go other places. We can make sure that we celebrate those. So, hear what the Spirit is saying to you. Now I want to take some verses because this was the, this is what brought me into the Messianic movement when I was a pastor. May I use that term? When I was a pastor and uh, trying to figure out what God wanted for me. And I was, the problem was that I was, this was when I was in that famous, uh, that famous church up in, where was it, the pub? <laughs> in Pilchuk. How many anyone know where Pilchuk is? Okay, near Verlot and all that. Well, I was pastoring Pilchuk Valley Chapel. And it was my first, you know, time as a pastor. And uh, there were about 400 people, and I, they didn't. I don't think they even knew I was Jewish, except for the board, because <laughs> I was trying to hide myself from any of that. And and at that point, I, you know, my Jewishness was something I wanted to leave at the Jewish Community Center in Long Beach. <laughs> but you can't really do it. You can't really do it. But one day I started reading Romans 9, 10, and 11, and you know what happens. And if you don't, get the cassette. <laughs> eBay. Stan, you can get those out for me. <laughs> and um, I read 9, 10, and 11. Yeah. And I was amazed yeah. of, and I'm sitting there going, wait, nobody told me that Romans had all this prophecy in it. Yeah. I mean, they, they tell you about Daniel, they tell you about Revelation, they go through a lot of these things of prophecy, Ezekiel, but, they, but when it comes to Romans, it's well, it just tells you, you know, like what you should eat, what you shouldn't eat, and you know, why God likes certain people and other, not others, and how to be holy. And I'm going, wait a minute, no. 
He is giving us a roadmap. He is giving us a prophetic roadmap to help us to, um, to hear that call in our lives. So uh, I'm going to hear Romans 11. I'll start at 20, verse 25. For brothers, I want you to understand this truth, which God formerly concealed, but now has revealed, mm -hmm. so that you won't imagine you know more than you actually do, which is a problem many of us have, <laughs> okay? It is that stoniness to a degree has come upon Israel until the Gentile world enters into its fullness and that it is in this way that all Israel will be saved. Amazing verses. Isn't it? Amazing verses. Out of Zion will come the Redeemer. He will turn away ungodliness from Yaakov. And this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sin. <laughs> you know, that's both for the individual who needs that salvation as well as corporately for all Israel as well as nationally for Israel, for all of them. And so I read this and I'm going, wait a minute. If God's going to do this, we better get ready. By the we, I meant me. Uh, we better get ready. How, what does God want? How can I be a part of this? And as I prayed about that, it was like God worked on me so hard and pulled me out of the church and said, you have to start that Messianic congregation. And that was the birth of Emmaus. It came from a call from the scriptures, a prophetic call that said, you have a job to do. Wow. You have a person to be. You have a witness to become. And you got some time to do this. And so, you know, here you go. You start this out. In Isaiah 43, it says, for, God says, for you are my witnesses. Amen. You are the ones to share this work of the gospel that Yeshua died, rose for you, for me, and brings forgiveness, Yom Kippur, to all of us. You are the ones to live as a witness, as a, a, a messianic community, celebrating my biblical festivals and living a life that declares to others, to, to both Jew and Gentile, what it really means to be a messianic follower of the Most High God. You're the ones to do that. You're the ones who are called to go out. So here you are, now. 40 years later, Amen. right? And you say to yourself, 40 years, I heard a call way back, way back, right? When I was young, I heard that call. But I'm telling you that God is calling us today. He's calling us again. That that 40 year period that 40-year period has come to an end and it's time for us to move into the promised land. Amen. The 40 years is gone and the time of testing and temptation is behind you. And it's time to move into that place of God using you as a witness. That's those things of the last 40 years. Now, I'm supposed to be here telling you to let's celebrate 40 years. And I'm telling you, forget the 40 years. <laughs> 40 years just means that we're ready to go. Yes. The 40 years means that we're ready to be what God wants us to be. And, and uh, Beit Tikva has 40 years ahead of them that they need to start getting ready for. What is that going to look like? What is Bob going to look like in 40 years? <laughs> You know, what, 40 years, forget it. <laughs> but you see, you're going through a transition, right? And transitions can be pretty scary. They're very, you know, you're like not there, not there, you're in the middle and you don't know what's coming in the future. Scary times. But I'm here to tell you something. This transition has come at this time for a reason. Yeah. Because he's gonna, but he wants to, because he wants to call you to this transition. 
He wants to help you to transit to this new reality that he has. He's going to make a new thing for you. Yep. He's going to give you second tablets so you can come down and totally receive the forgiveness for all the times you blew it with the last tablet. And now you can go and step into that place of the forgiveness of Yom Kippur, of Messiah Yeshua, and what he did for you. You see? This is a new day for for, for Beit Tikva. I always want to say Emmaus, but it's Beit Tikva. <laughs> for slash Beit Tikva. Okay. Uh, this is a new day. It's a new day for Rabbi Hyland and Rita. It's a new day for Joey, for all of you who are ushers and worship leaders, etc. And God really wants to, to you to hear a call again. So I'm going to encourage you. Go home. Pray and say, Lord, what do you want me to be and to do in this whole new period as we enter the land? You know, they just, they grumbled in the Israelites, grumbled and complained going through the desert. But when it came time to go in and conquer the land, it's like, grab that sword and let's go. We're going to have a great time. Amen. And that's what's going to happen. I don't know. I, I, I want to come back in another 10 years. And I want to be able to see what God has done here. And I know I will feel the same uh, nachis that I feel today because I will see all of you in that place of fighting the good fight, being faithful servants, being great witnesses, and establishing a new Beit and new ministry and new ways of doing things. I don't know what it'll look like. I don't know how same or different it'll be. But whatever it is, the Holy Spirit is the one who is here guiding it, leading it, whatever. And whether it's at Tai or Hayak or Ashwood or whatever it goes, whatever it does, whoever comes, whoever goes, you need to listen. Listen to that call. Let's pray together. Avinu Malkin, we thank you, we bless you. We thank you so much, Lord, for what you've done and all these people that you've worked through. You've worked in lives in so many ways. And I just ask you a blessing upon them. Not just because I love them and I am so proud of them, but Lord God, because they listened and they heard the call and they obeyed. And Lord, I ask that you would continue to do that work in their lives. Blessing, not curse joy not challenge that you would continue to pour out your spirit and not drought and dryness you would rain it down upon them lord god and father i pray that in the time coming ahead for rabbi highland and rita lord i i went through that i know what that's like not easy never is but I know, Lord God, that you're, you're making over Highland and Rita into, you're making them into new people. Yes. He needs to hear that call, the new call that you've given to him. Yeah. She needs to hear that new call. And you need to bind them together even stronger than ever before. Lord, I ask that you continue to pour out your spirit. Lord, continue to bless the worship team, to bless the ushers, Bless the administrators, everyone who has been uh, so faithful in doing the work of ministry now yeah. for all these years. We yeah. thank you for this. In Yeshua's name, yeah. amen. amen. amen.
and a Gravelly Lake Road or something? Gravelly Lake Road. Gravelly Lake Road. Yeah. And he goes to some conference somewhere and he comes back and he goes, hey. He goes, watch this. <laughs> Six years yeah. that have taken Bay Tikva here. Wow. And, I'm, <laughs> and I'm with Rabbi Murray. That's all great and everything. God, what do you have? Yeah. Right? Um, I can't tell you anything about the future. I can't even tell you about tomorrow, other than the men's barbecue that's happening. <laughs> but um, I do want to share a verse. That's why I have my Bible here. And it's Matthew chapter 25, verse 23. He says, His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful slave. You are faithful in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. I wish for all of us to desire that joy and to entering into God's joy Amen. and being found faithful Amen. in the calling yes. to a body to a ministry, to your purpose, to your calling, and even mine as I step into it, and in Highland as he steps into his, and many others, yes. that we may be found faithful Amen. in God. Amen. And that's all we're doing it here for, is for God. Amen. And may we continue to do that in the next 40 years. Amen. And faithfulness Amen. in context of all of this to glorify God. Yes. To be found faithful servants in Messiah. 